All right, here we are again. This is Paul Roebuck uh, talking about red flag property inspections. And we've got a series of videos that we're doing. Uh, we'll be trying to come across and show this to you and discuss these with you. These are recorded messages or videos. So if you have questions, you can always send me an email and I will gladly try to get back to you. This is part four of a six part webinar. So if you missed our other uh, parts of the webinar, you can go back and watch them anytime on internachi.org. Uh, but if you have questions or concerns, or if you have a comment, I mean, a class topic you'd like for us to go into and present to you, uh, email me, paul at internachi.org. We'll be glad to try to give you the help to make you a better inspector out in the field and help you be the best that you can possibly be. All right, so here we go. Let's hang on, let's see what we got on this one. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about hazardous vegetations. So as you go around the house doing your inspection, check around the house for your trees, shrubs, that could cause damages. Trees planted too close to the house, shrubs that are with less than five feet uh, from the side of the house, the very large trees, let's say even up to 15 feet away from the house. They can all have an effect on the foundation and on the exterior of the house. The roots of large trees and shrubs can grow underneath the foundation, patios, driveways, sidewalks, breaking the sidewalks with their roots, causing the slab of the house to heave or, or crack. Uh, whenever the ends of the tree branches, wherever the ends of the tree branches are, is where the roots of the tree are. So if you got a tree limb that reaches out 30 feet on each side of the tree, then you probably got roots that reaching out as far, if not further. Uh, some of the studies I've been through and, and classes I've taken up at Texas A&M University, they actually tell us that some of the trees, the older, bigger trees, the roots can actually go for across streets and neighborhoods to the next streets and and so on. I mean, by the time they get way out like that, they may be the size of a of a, a piece of pencil lead, but the roots nevertheless keep growing out. So this causes transpiration, the removal of moisture from underneath the foundation. The tree roots are something that, that you want to look at. As I said in one of our earlier presentations, if you pull up in front of a home that you're inspecting and it has a sidewalk and a concrete sidewalk, concrete driveway, and you see that the concrete's all busted up, has heaved, uneven, cracked, look around and see your tree roots. The tree roots may be the cause uh, because they're not enough watering to the, to the yard that the tree roots start coming up. If you see that outside on, on the driveways, on the sidewalks, chances are that you're going to have the same issue inside with your foundation. So make sure you, you look, pay attention to what's growing around the house, and uh, uh, it may be an, a red flag. You need to look for something more serious inside the house. But tree branches should never extend over the roof of a house unless you've hired a qualified tree surgeon to place a root barrier uh, along the foundation between that root tree and the house itself, uh, root barriers where they basically put like a sheet of some type of steel or metal or something down and separate to make the make it where the roots of the tree won't grow under the house or to the house. Sometimes that actually kills a tree, so that's a issue. You don't want that uh, tree branches to go across the roof of the house. And several things: the leaves drop, the gutters get clogged. Uh, the limbs break, falls on the roof, causes roof damage as the wind blows and the limbs slap against the shingles. And a lot of different things can happen. But branches extending over and in close proximity to the roof generally cause damage to the roof during the heavy storms or high wind situations. The ideal placement of trees is about one and a half times its mature height away from the house. Yeah, you heard me correct. A new construction I see on plant trees that I know are going to be 30, 40 foot tall trees, they plant them within three feet of the house. Well, that's going to create problems in the long run. You know, they think that the small tree, that's where it's going to be the same size forever. Well, that doesn't happen. The trees are planted and they're supposed to grow. So sometimes it's, it's something as an inspector, we should point out to our clients. I mean, if it's a large tree, sitting right next to the foundation. It's been there for 20, 30 years. The house is fine. There's not a problem. The tree's probably not going to cause them a problem at that stage. It's been there long enough. The slab and the 
tree that kind of work together and not cause issues. So that's probably fine. But new construction, maybe something you want to point out to them. Among some of the common hazards of dead, unhealthy trees, uh, if you find a dead, unhealthy tree on a piece of property that you're inspecting, probably a good sign, a good time to tell the new people, your clients that's buying a home, hey, you got a dead tree back here. You may want to ask the owners to have that tree removed uh, because sooner or later, somebody's going to have to have it removed. If it's tall enough and it's at the size that can fall on the house and cause property damage, definitely it's an issue that should be reported as a deficiency on your report, even though it's a tree, which is not something we normally look for, but we report on, we look at the calls and what could happen sometimes and have to report on it from that standpoint. But dead trees are dangerous. They are unstable. Their moderate winds can cause, often cause them to tumble, topple over, causing damage to the structure, and not to mention the possibility of injuries to the building's occupants. Dead and unhealthy trees should be identified. As I said, especially those close to the habitable structures, they need to be aware of it and, and maybe suggest to them that they have them removed. Poisonous plants, many of which are volunteer in a house landscape, they just kind of come up, they're weed, they grow, but they're poisonous plants, they can cause health, pro health problems. Not that we have to identify those type of plants, but some of those that we might see may be poison oak, poison sumac, poison ivy, castor bean, and so on. Maybe different in your part of the country where down in my area, poison oak and poison ivy are, are, are common. Uh, you know, I don't personally report on those, but you know, if I'm walking around, the client happens to be with me and we spot some of, the, some of those uh, uh, items, I'll point out to them, look, you probably need to have somebody that's not allergic to these uh, to come and pull these things up. But any of these located near the house should be documented and disclosed. It's just something you want to point out because it's safety. You don't want clients to get hurt, and you don't want to get something like that. Even if you didn't report poison oak, poison ivy, you know, as a home inspector, I'm not sure that would be something that would be an issue for you because that's beyond our scope of the inspection. But common courtesy, if you see it, you probably want to report it to your client, make them aware of it. All right, switching gears now from, from that, let's go to septic system for a little bit. When a home is not on the city sewage system, the house will usually have one of two different types of septics. And I will tell you, we do offer courses on septic systems uh, and how to inspect these things online. Great courses. If you haven't taken it, if you're in rural areas where you do have septic systems and you'd like to increase your uh, bottom line of, of fees for inspection, you can inspect these type of systems by being qualified to do them. I don't tell you just jump out and start doing them. If you don't know what a septic system is, don't know how it operates, don't know how they're installed, uh, don't do them. Uh, exclude them. Tell your client, hey, I don't inspect septic systems. But if you want to increase your bottom line, become knowledgeable on the things and, and you can offer that service to your, cl to your clients. Uh, the first and most common type of, of a septic system is with a soil drain fill. Uh, this means that the tanks are buried, usually they're concrete, and there's a soil drain fill going out. It can be several different types of drain fill. A lot of times they'll dig a trench, put a perforated pipe down in it, set on top of straw, uh, rocks, straw, cover it back up with straw, rocks, and then dirt. And what this does, as a as the tanks get full, the liquid flows out through the drain lines, and then it's dispersed into the ground around it. Uh, those are called septic fill, uh, drain lines, fill lines. Uh, those can get stopped up. Tree roofs can grow into them. Uh, you can run over them sometimes if uh, heavy equipment and crush them. Uh, they can certainly be become a problem, get stopped up. Sometimes you have to have them pressure uh, washed and cleaned to make them work right. So there's a lot, of, a lot of pros and cons about septic systems. Second type of system is an aerator aerobic system that has sprinkler heads or spray heads or it can have a drip line to disperse the processed wastewater. This would be what we call a aerobic system. The aerobic system has, a, has several different tanks in it. Uh, the first one that takes care of all the solids. And inside that one, there's an air compressor that blows air in it that keeps the water circulating 
uh, not the water, but all the waste circulates. And it, the purpose of that is trying to break it apart. And then it goes to another tank as it comes up liquid, it overflows to another tank. And then it goes to another tank. Finally, it gets to a treatment tank where it's chlorinated and uh, it goes out to either a drip line system where it drips water out uh, slowly to the to the ground out where the lines are ran. Uh, and some, it has a sprinkler head. It looks kind of like a lawn irrigation system. And these sprinkler heads will come on once that final tank gets water to reach the height that has a couple of floats in it. And those floats will kick a pump on, and then it'll pump the water out into these spray heads, and they will spray. I mean, they spray 30, 40 feet uh, in a 360-degree radius. And uh, uh, that's how the water gets out of the tank once it gets to that level. So several different ones, but indication of malfunction systems, uh, you'd be looking for visible signs of seepage. If you walk out on the, on the yard, once you see it has a septic, if you're inspecting a septic system, if you walk out through the uh, yard where the septic lines should be, or you think they are, if you start seeing raw sewage floating, or if you smell that sewage smell, you shouldn't be able to smell that. Uh, a clean, good operating system, you won't have that smell. You won't have that odor. One that has issues that stopped up, you'll smell it. Uh, septic system needs to be at least 50 feet from a water well, from an underground system, from streams, from lakes, ponds, sprinkler system, and even a swimming pool. I did an inspection uh, some time back, and uh, the people's septic system uh, had spray heads to it, like we was talking about on the aerobic system. And the house next door had put a above-ground pool right at the fence line separating the two properties. Well, the property I was inspected as a septic system kicked on that I was testing it, the spray heads popped up and it sprayed 30, 40 feet. And it was within 20 feet of the fence where this above ground pool was. So the people that owned the house I was inspecting was actually putting sewage water into the neighbor's swimming pool. So that was something I had to report as it needed to be corrected uh, for safety issue for not only my clients, you know, someone's not gonna be happy if I were sewage being shot in their pool even though it's maybe treated water, you 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 decide how much treated water and how pure that water is being sprayed into the neighbor's pool. Uh, I, I wrote it up as a deficiency and recommended further evaluation by a qualified septic contractor. Uh, and I always like to use the term in in Texas. We have we have a uh, in our contracts legal real estate contracts. Uh, I like to tell them to have it done before their option period is over. In Texas, I don't know how your part of the country's contracts read, but you may try to get a real estate contract and read it. In Texas, we have a deal that says uh, once your option period is over with, then you're buying that house. So if the, the realtor's given them seven or 10 days to have their inspection done and the inspection is done, if the new buyers don't say, look, I want Mr. Buyer to fix this item, this item, that item, then the buyer and sellers, they have to disagree because the seller at that stage doesn't have to do anything. Uh, but the buyer is obligated by the house. So I like to put my con in my reports, have these repairs or deficiencies taken care of or further evaluated prior to the end of your option period. That way I protect my client. So that's my job is protect the client. One that's paying me uh, the big bucks to come out and do the home inspection. I want to do the best I can for them. I'm sure you do the same. Okay, garage doors. And garage door springs are designed with wire. Cable runs through the center so that it's spring. if the spring shatters, pieces don't fly through the air like a bullet. That's a big safety concern, uh, something you want to check for. The other thing on garage doors, newer building codes, I say newer, probably within the past 10 years, building codes now have required self-closing hinges to be installed on doors that go from an attached car garage into a house. In other words, if you walk from the garage directly into the house, that door separating the garage from the house should have door hinges on it that automatically causes that door to close. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's considered to be a fire hazard. Uh, that wall separating the garage and the house is a fire rated wall. 
so is that door. That's why we require that door to be a solid fire rated type door. Uh, so that means it can't have any animal doors cut into it, can't have any windows cut into it. Uh, it can't be a hollow core door. It has to be something solid uh, or a fire rated type door with self-closing hinges, meaning once you open the door, it automatically closes by itself. New construction should have those. Like I said, anywhere from, gee, I would say 10 years plus ago, that's been a code requirement. Uh, swimming pools and spas. You want to check the levelness of pools and spas. Measure the distance from the rim of the pool to the surface of the water. Water should be within a half inch of the same level all the way around the pool. In other words, if you look at the water, water self-leveling. Uh, sometimes the pools are not. Uh, if you have a pool where you see water up touching the inch and a half on one side of the, of the edge of the pool, the other side is six inches, guess what? You've got a pool that's not level. It's not like it should be, and that could be an issue with it. So uh, look for the water level. It should be a half inch of the same level all the way around that pool. If it's something different than that, then that would be a red flag to write up and recommend further profession, further reviews by a professional pool contractor. The sides of the bottom of the pool should be the sound from and free from any type of cracks. Uh, you want to look for any cracks on it. Best thing to do is make sure that you turn the, uh, I should say, if you're not inspecting swimming pools, again, we have classes to train you on pools and spas and we even have certification classes and you can take them online different places to get certified to inspect pools and spas. I encourage you before you start inspecting these type of system, you do get qualified to do that, uh, to qualified to inspect them. Uh, sides and bottoms of pools should be sound and free from any cracks. The easiest way to look for that is make sure you turn the pumps off. If that water's, the pump's on and the water's circulating in that pool, you're going to have little ripple effects through the pool. It can cause your vision to miss cracks that you might not see uh, until the water's still. So go turn the pool pumps off first and then start inspecting the pool, the bottom and the side of the pool. If you start seeing cracks, then that's a red flag. Inspect the deck around the pool for cracks and uneven areas. A lot of times what I see is the coping, uh, the sidewalk section around the pool right where it meets the coping of the pool itself, there'll be a gap. If that gap is open, then water can get down in between that gap. And of course, it's like a foundational house. It can cause soil to swell or shrink, and it'll cause that pool decking around the pool to rise or go low or cause a pool to pop up. I've actually had a house I inspected with a in-ground pool totally popped up out of the ground. They called me to inspect the pool. I get there and I've got an in-ground pool, concrete pool, that's totally out of the ground. What had happened, they drained it and didn't know they were supposed to put a pump in there, uh, keep the water underneath the pool from gathering and causing that to pop up. So they learned a valuable mistake there and made my job real easy to tell them, yep, you screwed up, get a pool company to come in and fix it. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on something like that. It's not necessary. It's not my job to tell them how to fix it. Not my job to tell them, hey, you screwed up. But sometimes you just say, hey, this is probably what happened. Get it fixed. But look for those areas. Those, those decking areas need to be sealed. Uh, they make a deck seal product that you can fill in those gaps, and that prevents water getting down in, in between there and causing problems. So uh, be careful looking at those things. I always write that up if I've got gaps. If it's not sealed good, I write it up. It needs to be properly sealed. But beware of being electrical cables within 22 feet of the surface of the pool or 14 feet any direction of the diving board. Diving boards, a lot of homeowners insurance won't even insure a home with a pool if it has a diving board. Uh, growing up, my kids always wanted a diving board. We had them. Uh, as long as the insurance company wasn't aware of it, we had a diving board. But they won't dive, they don't like diving boards because people tend to dive off them sideways. And of course, the pool bottoms and sides are concaved at the bottom. Eight. They're not squared off. They're concaved so water flows and, and runs good. And a lot of times people think, well, I've got a 10 foot pool. 
Well, if you dive off side of a pool, a diving board into the pool, you may only have seven feet. So sometimes it's misleading and you get certain, certain people, certain people diving off in those directions could certainly be hurt. So careful on, on that diving boards. That, that could be a safety issue, whether you ride up or not, that's going to be up to you. I mean, you are the professional looking at it. You're trained, qualified if you're doing pool inspection. So, yeah, it's up to you if you want to ride up or just mention, the, hey, the diving boards can be hazardous. Uh, all pool spas are now required to have a barrier, a 48-inch high surrounding them. The barrier should not allow passage of a four-inch diameter spear. In other words, all swimming pools have to have some type of a fence around them to prevent children from getting in and drowning. Uh, those fence gates on those type of fence have to be self-closing and locking. If you've been to any hotel, uh, motel pools, and they had a fence around it, you probably saw the type of fence and gate that they have to have. Commercial property pools get to be a total different ball game than residential when it comes to inspecting them. So. If you're inspecting commercial properties, you need a little bit more training on pools for commercial properties because they are a different breed than what residential pools are. Just throwing that out to you. But today we're talking about just home inspections. But the fence gates have to be self-closing and locking. Uh, that's so a, a child goes in or out or a parent takes one in or out that a small child can't get in there without themselves. A lot of time it'll be a bar type lock where you have to lift it from the top of the 44 inch or 48 inch fence, lift it up to open the gate where a child can't reach that high to get into the pool by themselves. The other thing on the doors going in, into the back of the house, the doors, if there's a pool back there, the doors should have some type of an alarm on it. So if that door is opened, the alarm goes off inside the house this is so the parents sitting in a house working in an office or cooking in the kitchen or doing whatever they want to do, watching TV. If a child opens that door to go out, that alarm goes off, lets that parent know, hey, my child's getting out the back door. Get them away from that pool. Just a safety deal. So a lot of this stuff is in the, is in the code items for people to inspect. But it's good items for you to look to be aware of and uh, be able to mention to your client maybe as a, a defect in your inspection report or as a safety upgrade. I mean, however you want to do it, I know in different parts of the country we write reports differently. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can make recommendation. Uh, this may be something you want to make a recommendation to. But the pool fence also keeps your neighbor kids from coming in, going swimming when you're not home. Or even when you're home, they come in at night and go swimming. Uh, if somebody drowns, all of a sudden, guess who's responsible? The homeowner. So it, it's vitally important that they're aware that, you know, this thing should have a fence. I mean, if it's in the backyard and they've got a six-foot wood fence around it, that's great. That'll work. The next thing comes into, does the gate self-close, self-latch? If not, then that's a deficiency, something you should write up on your report as, as the need of repair. So I hope you got something out of the pool spa on that part of it. But improper pool, installed pool barriers, fences, and gates should be considered as a drowning safety hazard. You can refer to the following link for additional safety information provided by the Consumer Protection Safety Council uh, for homeowners pool safety. This is a great website. This is something that you can copy, save in your uh, auto text files that you put in your reports when you have a pool. You can include this link. And if you're writing something up as a safety, if the fence isn't appropriate or properly installed, the gates don't open and self-close and latch, then this would be a link you put in it. Look, for further evaluate, further information, re please refer to this. Then, of course, the Virginia Crane Baker Pool Safety uh, Act is a federal law that influences pool barriers and entrapment prevention components. That's another good one. I mean, these, these two pages are information here something if you're inspecting pools this is something you probably should include in your comment section to make the uh your client be aware that these are some issues you need to learn more about because i guarantee hey we all love our kids and the last thing that me or you would want is for a child to drown in a pool because of uh, bare pool barriers wasn't installed correctly and you didn't didn't report it 
that, that that would be a tragedy that we should never have to go through. Neither should our clients. I mean, as we said before, you're there to, ins- to be their professional. You're there to share your knowledge. That's why whenever you inspect additional systems such as pools and spas or septics or sprinkler system, whatever, uh, you want to be qualified. You want to be well-trained to, to be able to tell people that, hey, I, I know what I'm talking about here. And uh, you don't want to go in there and just start making stuff up. You know, sometimes a good talker is a good liar. And sometimes what we what people say is not the fact. We don't want you doing that. We want you to be able to share with them the truth because you're based on knowledge. You're based on some professional organization such as the cpsp.gov website to let people know. So please study. Please be prepared. And if you go out and do these type of inspections, protect your client. That's what this is all about. And I guarantee you'll get the referral business, your inspection business will grow because of the honesty, because of your sincerity, and because of your professionalism and your knowledge. People will refer you and say, hey, this is the greatest inspector around, man. You need to call this guy. I built a business of 30 years doing just that. I know it works. Another thing about pools and spas, they should have an anti-vortex drain cover on all drains. Uh, new pools should have at least two drain openings separated by at least two drain outlets at, by at least three feet apart. In other words, you don't want two drains in the bottom of that pool separate, not separated. If they're close together, that can <clears throat> uh, flat type drain covers recommended replace be replaced with anti vortex drain. What this does, it prevents uh, not just a child, but someone say they have a t shirt on or a person with long hair, they dive down to the bottom if that pump is running and sucking that water out to recirculate that water in the pool, they can suck somebody right to the drain. And there's some horrible situations that have been there. I mean, they actually had a small child that was, well, I won't go into the gory detail, but he, he was torn apart by the drain because of the suction of it. Just a small child dove down. So drain covers... And the type of drain covers and the placement of those drains. Older pools, they used to put two drains right next to each other. That created such a suction. If you got down there, it would hold you down as an adult, much less a small child. But entrapment occurs when someone's held underwater by the force of suction created by the circulation system pump. This force can be strong, so strong that people have had their intestines sucked out of their body. That's pretty gross. That's what I'm talking about. It pulls you apart. And entrapments are rare, but it occurs often enough that these requirements for devices that help prevent entrapment are now in effect. So d- don't, you know, don't inspect a pool if you're not qualified, because you'd hate for something like this to come up and then it come back and and, and be on your record uh, or something you have to live with the rest of your life. So just be qualified. That's all it is. Be trained and qualified. The better you train more qualified you are, the better you can do it, and the more money you can charge. Now, here's one that we don't usually look at, but tennis courts. I've had a few over the years that I, I've had inspected larger properties that were very expensive uh, homes, but tennis courts are usually concrete, asphalt. It's important that the court be in good condition. Yeah, if you play, ever play tennis or watch them play, they need a flat surface. So tennis courts should be higher, slightly higher in the center so that sides – uh, on the side so that the water drains off. The water should not form puddles on the court. But both asphalt and concrete tennis courts should be inspected for cracks, settlement, unevenness, same way that we use for inspecting a driveway or sidewalk. So, you know, it, it, tennis courts are not that complicated to inspect. But the biggest thing is you want to watch that uh, surface, make sure it doesn't hold water and that it's, it doesn't have any uneven areas, something where People are out running and playing, can trip and cause injuries to them. So uh, don't pass up a tennis court. You can charge extra for that one and make a few extra bucks while you're there. If you're there anyway, why not? Play structures. Play structures for children such as tree houses or elaborate swing sets, either freestanding or in trees, can be quite hazardous. I typically would not inspect these things because of children getting injured on them. I usually would would put a disclaimer on my reports that I do not inspect playhouses, structures such as this. But, you know, and I tell you now, if you don't feel comfortable inspecting these structures, 
refer them to a professional carpenter, a structural engineer for more in-depth evaluation. I, I tell you now, I'd stay away from these things because kids get hurt. They're not very careful on a lot of things. They get hurt pretty easily. I, I personally would just not inspect those. Just saying. All right, illegal additions. What are we talking about here? Well, let me have a sip and wet my throat here for a minute. Illegal additions of houses are, are a very common problem. Uh, if you notice a specific area of a home that does not appear to be built with the same style or quality as the rest of the home, you should question a homeowner to see if they're aware of any additions to the house without proper permits. Many additions built without a permit are built by people who are not aware of local building codes, electrical, plumbing, or mechanical codes. Some homeowner's insurance programs may not cover additions made to a house without proper permits and proper proof of the permits uh, being approved by the municipality where the home's located. So that's a biggie. For, as an inspector, though, if you start seeing additions made to a home, you should report that this home has had modifications or additions added on to it and, you know, whatever default statement you want to add from there, but you should at least make a note in your report that you notice that this home has had some additions put to it. And, uh, you know, you may even say this like, and I'm writing in the uh, slide here, you may suggest to your client that they have the previous, have the homeowner provide all proper building permits that were pulled for this house, for this remodel or addition. That could that could save your client a lot of time and money in the long run. So just a thought for you, but good good things to know. All right, basements and crawl spaces. Well, the same methods used for inspecting foundations should be used for inspecting basement walls. Walk along the basement walls, no further than five feet away from the foundation, using a strong flashlight. In our business, a strong flashlight, folks, is is something that you definitely want to hold on to because that's uh, – uh, flashlights can add a lot of things. I tell builders all the times I do new construction. My flashlight reveals a lot of sins. You know, it's like God's light shining on you. Uh, darkness can't hide. Well, flaws in buildings can't hide with a good flashlight. Uh, you can order those through Internet also. They've got some great flashlights, and uh, I highly recommend them. I don't recommend any flashlight that uses a uh C cell or D cell or triple A or whatever. I like a rechargeable battery in mine where I can charge it, keep it fresh and going uh, strong. I always keep a backup just in case because you never know. You drop it, you bust the bulb or something happens, but keep an extra flashlight just for, just for safety sakes. But as you walk around the walls looking at it with your flashlight, note the type of, of wall structure, what type of material, location and any angle of any existing cracks. You want to note that. Take a picture of it. Put it in your report. This is what you see. Remember, we are not only the home inspector, but our job is to, as a reporter. We report what we see during that inspection at the time of the inspection. Be alert for white powdery deposits along foundation and basement walls, especially if there are also visible water stains. Look for sub pumps in the lower part of the basement floor. What is that for? Well, if there's a sub pump, it most likely means it has been installed as a result of incoming water. Uh, if water is coming in that basement, you want to get that water out. So a lot of times we'll put a sub pump down to suck the water out. So if you see a sub pump, that could be something that uh, you may want to put a comment in your report. Just take a picture. Let people know that's what it is. That's usually what it's for. Uh, cracks develop in the walls of a house. They do it for num numerous reasons. Wood frame housings of a house, they may dry out. They shrink shortly after the house built. Uh, There's certain moisture levels that wood should have whenever we're building a house. And if it's higher than what uh, moisture content normally would be, then as a house is built and dried inside conditioned space, it begins to dry that wood out. Well, what happens then? You start having nails that look like nail pops where it's sunk into the uh, drywall, or it could be go the opposite direction. Depending on the wood, if it's 
wet and it dries out, it's going to cause some of that. But yeah, almost every house, you're going to find a few hairline cracks caused by shrinkage of the wood. Drywall is going to crack. I mean, you're going to get some of that. Just the drywall mud that we use, it, as it dries, it's going to shrink. Uh, it's going to cause some cracks. It's not unusual. But that doesn't mean it's a structural issue. It just means it's cosmetic. Uh, should you write it up in your report? I'll leave it up to you. I mean, could it be a deficiency? If you have a client that's really concerned about drywall cracks, put it in the report. Nail pops, they need to know about them. Uh, differential movement of structure can occur caused by foundation movement or structural defects that can cause significant wall cracking. Uh, sometimes if you start seeing a lot of cracks in a wall, uh, you see windows seals that are not leveled, doors that are misaligned, not leveled, uh, cracks in the drywall floor, uh, walls or ceiling, then that could also be that there is some foundation movement going on. But inspecting for cracking, you should pay particular attention to common cracks locations, such as the corners of windows, doors, and walls of, of rooms. If you have a door section, let's say, uh, or a when the framing of the door and you have a stair step crack going off from the edge of the frame going off towards the ceiling, you may have some differential movement going on. So that kind of a crack may be more than just cosmetic and you want to uh, recommend further evaluation to it. Uh, consciously look for cracks behind curtains. Move the curtains out of the way and ceilings throughout the house and make written notes of the amount and severity of any cracks observed. If you're seeing cracks everywhere, all over the place, you need to write it up regardless whether it's cosmetic or not because your client's going to be concerned with it. Maybe not today, but maybe a month from now when he calls you and says, I wish you had told me all this stuff. I'd had to sell or fix it or give me money to have the repairs done. So be careful on that. Uh, a significant amount of diagonal cracking, large cracks, spaces associated with other indications, such as sloping floors or sticking windows or doors, that's a concern. That's something you should be aware of and make your client aware of. Homeowners commonly paint patch homes for aesthetic reasons prior to selling them. Uh, they go in and they do all kinds of cover-up. I've even been in houses where the day of the inspection, the paint's still wet where they try to caulk and cover up some cracks or some water stains. Uh, uh, <laughs> you've been in the inspection long, business long enough, you're going to find all kinds of stuff that uh, we could write books about horrors of inspection. Uh, but homeowners, a lot of times, inadvertently conceal or hide defects. Sometimes they just don't know. Other times they try to actually hide it so you don't see it. And if you don't see it, you can't report it and the buyers are, are just as unaware as, as you are about it until after they move into the house. So cracks are something you definitely be, need to be aware of. Uh, the following are usually concealed by the owners. Wall cracks, torn and puckered drywall tape. A lot of times you see it, drywall tape looks wrinkly. Well, a lot of time it indicates movement. Wall water stains, sticking doors, windows, you should try to identify any possible defects that you can during your inspection. Often a patch wall area will have a different surface texture from the rest of the wall. It's hard to match texture sometimes, and that's what the homeowners try to do, and some even painters sometimes, drywall experts, they can't make the texture match perfectly. But the color of paint may be slightly different. Remember I told you you need a good flashlight? Well, this is where a good flashlight really comes in because It'll, it'll stand those things out in a flash. Uh, sometimes wallpaper is used to redecorate walls so they can conceal cracks. Uh, some of the times the cracks can be felt uh, with the fingertip. You slide your finger along the wall just a little bit there. If you suspect a crack, you may find that, hey, there was a crack there and it's somebody's tried to cover it over. So, you know, a lot of times as inspectors, we're detectives also, but you know, you can only report what you see, but be careful because you want to be assured that you see everything that you should be seeing. Sloping floors, you know, in a typical house, floors are su sufficiently level and any sloping can be determined only by precise measuring. Uh, but you can, you can walk across the floor. Does it feel springy? Uh, very springy floor indicates a possible problem with the interior floor structure. 
lot of times you walk across a, a floor in the basement or the crawl space of a house, there's a lot of moisture. You start to feel the floor kind of give, give a little give, kind of bouncy as you walk on it. That could be rot underneath there that you need to make a note of and comment on. You should look for cracks in all the tiles and marble floors. Uh, sometimes it's just the tile was not laid properly. The, the thin set we put underneath it was not thick enough, or it could be that there's continuous movement. If you start seeing cracks on one tile, it may just be simply the tile wasn't laid right. If you see it on multiple tiles going across the whole room, that could be indicative of foundation movement and uh, uh, should be written up as a deficiency. Uh, continuous vertical crack, it covers three sections of marble tile and a floor, as I just said, has something you should write up. It's a red flag. There could be more to it than just cracked tiles. Now, is it possible to have a house that the tiles, all of them are laid wrong? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it, people are human and contractors. They aren't all, all, all perfect. So, yeah, it could be. Uh, a lot of times you have a floor laid down. If it's not installed correctly, you haul in a big refrigerator on a dolly. <laughs> Every tile that dolly cross can cause the tiles to crack. Is that a defect? Uh, if I were buying a house, I wouldn't want my floors cracked. Would you? So would that be something I'd write up? Yeah, I'd write it up. you got damaged tiles. Uh, it's up to you. However you want to do it's your report. Uh, again, I would be as honest with my client as I possibly could because that's something that uh, it could come back and bother you down the road. So be careful on it, but report what you see on the thing. But there's tests that can reveal the levelness of a floor foundation. The shuffle walk, you know, you walk, kind of slide your feet on the floor, see if you feel uneven. Some inspectors take a ball, they roll the ball along just as a test to see if the floor is unlevel. If you roll a ball down, it's going to be an issue that the ball rolls one way or the other. Uh, a four-foot level, a lot of inspectors use a four-foot level. Well, a four-foot level is going to tell you what four-foot floor space is. Is it a level of four feet or not? So you're, you're limited on a four-foot level if it's level. Even if you move it to the next four foot, it could be a slope and the next four foot could be level with your level. So I don't encourage a four foot level, a zip level. Uh, that's an instrument that uh, I have used in my entire career of being a home inspector. Uh, that's a, a level and you can Google it, search for zip level. Uh, that's one of the most accurate instruments on the market that measures foundations. It's not the only thing it does, but as a home inspector, that would be the thing that you, you would use it for most. Uh, zip level is going to measure, you can measure the entire foundation from one side of the house to the other, to any section inside the house, and it gives you an overall view of it. I personally use a zip level on all of my home inspections and have for years because the foundation to me is the most expensive part of that house. It affects everything that the house rests on. And I want to give my client the best I can for it. I gained a lot of business by using zip level. Some people say, well, I don't want to use it. I'm afraid to because it puts me in a different league than a home inspector. No, not really. Uh, if you use it just for elevation readings, other foundations, you're, you're fine. As a home inspector, you can get by with that without any difficulty. You just have to be trained on it, understand how to use it and what the limitations are on it. And I promise you, it would add business to your home inspection business uh, because it would put you a step ahead of a lot of inspectors that don't use it. And uh, it would put you out there. I mean, you'd be able to get some foundation evaluation inspections. Again, increase your bottom dollar line. Uh, new construction, you can use it. If there's foundation issues in a home, people would call you to come out and evaluate it. That instrument is one tool that you can use besides all the visual signs that would help you know if that foundation uh, needs to be re-leveled or adjusted somehow. But whenever you're performing any of these type tests, you need to pay particular attention to the possibility that the outer walls of the house may have settled relatively to the interior walls. Uh, sometimes it depends on how the house settles, but uh, the outside walls can move and inside walls, I mean, you see a lot of it. If you start seeing in the attic, the rafter separation from the ridge board, that's a telltale sign. There's been some movement because houses are solid objects. And as they begin to move, one thing is going to affect something different. It's going to affect the window separation from the bricks. 
from the stucco, from the stone, from the siding. Rafters pulling apart from the ridge board. That's because the house shifted. It moved somehow, and that movement is going to be shown not just in one location, but in multiple locations. And the more experienced you are, the more you'll be able to get out there and look and see uh, and be able to come conf- be able to form your own opinion as to whether or not there's a foundation issue uh, or why the floor is actually sloped to start with. Uh, let's talk about each of these now. The shuffle walk. You walk across the floor quickly without lifting your feet. Keep the front part of your shoe on the floor. Move forward towards the outside wall of the house. Walking this way makes you much more sensitive to slopes. If the floor is not level, you will experience a feeling of going downhill. Some may only feel the slope when walking backwards. So if you don't feel it one way, turn and walk backwards. Others will not notice a slope at all. And I've had groups of inspectors where I've walked in trying to train them about foundations. And I've had inspectors that some of them could fill it by walking frontwards. Some of it couldn't. Some of them could fill it by walking backwards. And some of them couldn't fill it walking backwards. And I've had some that just no matter what, they couldn't fill it at all. I mean, drastic slopes in some of the foundations we looked at, some inspectors couldn't fill it by walking on it at all. That's why you need a proper instrument, a uh, tool that you can measure that with. And and that's, you, you, you just can't compete against it. So a proper tool is going to help you on it. Oops, I hit the button again. Sorry. Uh, the ball rolling. Using a smooth ball, such as a racket ball, first place on a hard floor near the middle of the room and see if it rolls. Uh, try, then try placing ball in several spots around the room. If the ball rolls to the same spot repeatedly, that spot most likely is lower than the rest of the floor. Uh, any evidence of sloping is something you should note in your report as a red flag item. It's something you need to report. It's unlevel. It may not be something needs repairs, but if it slopes, you need to at least let your client know, let them make that decision. You're this there as a reporter reporting what your findings are. Uh, sticking doors and windows. There's two things to look for when inspecting doors and windows. Do they stick whenever you open it? Do they drag on the floor? Will they shut completely and latch? Uneven space between doors and their frame. What's the door shut? Can you see from inside the room where you're at to the room on the other side of the door? If there's a gap there, then the doors are misaligned or not fitting properly. Uh, these two symptoms usually means that movement of the walls and floors have changed the shape of the window or the door frame. Something's caused that door to get out of whack, to mis- be, become misaligned. May have been a bad install. I don't know that, but if you find one window, one door or one window, then look for others. There may be more there. But I will tell you, one of the things you want to do as an inspector, always open and close every door and every window in the house because you don't know what's there. By opening and closing doors, uh, you you get to see what's on both sides of that door. Uh, And opening and shutting the windows, you get to know if it's going to open or shut or not. So if it's in a buy-in and it doesn't work, then there's an issue to it. That would be a red flag, something, note on your report. But when you're inspecting the doors, look at the space at the top, sides, and bottom. You can see gaps. You can see uneven. Yeah, if you got a half inch on the bottom of one door side, and on the other side of that same door, you got an inch and a half, that, that's a pretty noticeable gap. Something's going on. Uh, the door should resemble a long, narrow rectangle. It should be fit right into the door frame where, where you, uh, the door was installed. But you always want to look for signs if the door has been sawed or sanded to make it fit the crooked frame. I've actually seen doors where they were hollow core doors, and you know what I mean? There's, they're hollow in the center, but they have like a little oh, one-inch board, let's say, around the edge of the door to make it solid on the edges. I've had people saw those doors off so much that you can put your hand down inside the interior of the door uh, because they've sawn off too much. I've had a lot of times where people, homeowners try to adjust the doors to fit into the frame better because they dragged or were sticking. And believe it or not, I've seen contractors do the same thing. They saw off the wrong end of the door. So they make the door uh, way out of whack because they saw it off the wrong part. So yeah, it's comical, it's funny, 
yeah, things we'll see out there, as I said in one of the previous uh, presentations, inspections are like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to find. All right. Hazardous stairs. Stairs, treads, and risers. The tread that treads the horizontal part of the stair measures from the front to the back edge. From the back to the front edge of the stair, that's the part you put your feet on. The minimum tread depth should be 10 inches. A lot of times you see people put staircases in and you'll have less than 10 inches. Well, if you wear a size 10 shoe, uh, it probably ought to have full solid support on each step. Just guessing. Uh, if you wear a size 12, it may stick over a little bit. But you should have a solid foothold whenever you tap, step down on the stair step. Now, the winding treads shall have a minimum tread depth of 10 inches measured as above at a point of 12 inches from the side where the treads are narrower. You get one of the staircases that looks like a corkscrew going up. The stair steps are a little different than if you have just a typical stairs. Uh, but you should have at least the same type of foothold. And if you step on it, that you can have a solid footing. Otherwise, you could cause yourself to get off balance and fall. The riser, that's the vertical member between the two treads from the uh, minimum riser shall be a seven and three quarter inch, or the maximum, I'm sorry, the maximum. So the maximum is, is the, the height between this way. Uh, as you walk up or down a flight of stairs, you're going to fall into a certain rhythm. And you'll notice if one of the stair risers is off. Well, if you as an inspector, many staircases that you and I have probably climbed and will climb in our career, uh, you'll notice uneven stairs. If you find one riser that's uh, a little different than the rest of them, they'll throw you off. Every time you'll, you'll misstep and it can hurt your back, throw your feet out, uh, cause injuries. But a lot of people fall from that. It's amazing what, what can happen. I'll give you an illustration. I uh, met my neighbors. We lived on a golf course in, in the town we lived in. And across the golf course was a, a big house and uh, end up the lady at Balta house was a realtor. So I, I found that out. I went to her house to meet her one day and she said, come on in. So I walked in the house and we were sitting there drinking coffee and just neighborly chatting. And she had a large staircase going up to the second floor of her home. And I stood there and looked at the staircase. I said, wow. I said, do you know that your steps risers are uneven? She said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, I'm looking at it. I said, I can visually see that, you know, from one step to the next, they're not even going all the way up your staircase. You've got several steps here that the risers are uneven. She said, you know, it's interesting that you say that because my home inspector didn't tell me a word about it. And while we were moving in, my in-laws came to help us and they were staying upstairs and they fell, both of them fell down the stairs because of the steps being uneven. Well, see, I didn't inspect the property, so it wasn't my, my cup of tea there, uh, my bag. But just walking in and looking, my experience told me, hey, these stairs are uneven. And sure enough, it, it proves a case that just a little bit of variance, that you can see it as a home inspector. You see these things enough, you should be trained enough, and you pick that up visually. But walking up the stairs, going up and coming back down, you would feel those differences in the riser. And that's something that's a hazard. It's definitely a red flag that you need to report. Now, I don't know what happened to the inspector that inspected that house or what happened because of the injuries of, the, of people falling down the stairs, but I'm glad I wasn't the inspector that missed that. And I hope that none of you ever get in that situation where you miss it and someone gets hurt because of your lack of reporting something that as a professional, as an inspector, trained, maybe licensed or just trained, wherever you're at, this would be something you don't want to come back on you. Okay, again, I want to thank you for attending this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed our webinar. You'll come and watch all six parts of it. Uh, some of them may be a little longer, a little shorter than the others, but uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed them. If you have questions, comments. Again, my name is Paul Roebuck, and you can email me at paul at uh, with your comments, with your thoughts. If you liked the presentation, let me know. If you didn't like it, let me know. Uh, if there's other topics you'd like to, me to speak on or uh, like for InterNACHI to present, 
give them to us and we'll talk to the education department, see if we can't give you something that uh, can be beneficial to you and your home inspections. So until next time, happy inspecting and we'll see you again.